flow like water, flow like water, flow like water. Welcome to the DYCD at Home Filmmaking Series with Sharaf Maljud and Thomas Zanakis. Hi, how are you guys doing today? Great. Hi. Okay. Um, how have you guys been with the whole quarantine and everything that's going on right now? Have you been holding up? Uh, I really haven't left my apartment much, <laughs> <laughs> but holding up all right. Holding up all right, you know, surviving, staying safe, staying healthy, wearing a mask, and uh, you know, trying, trying, trying to stay healthy. Okay. Same here. Got my first dose of vaccine. Getting another one in three weeks, and after that, starting to live again. When the pandemic first started, what was it like to try to find a way to continue to produce the news? Well, we didn't stop producing the news. Um, when the pandemic, pre-pandemic, we were working on the coronavirus out of you know China. I think Tom and I were covering that. And then as it got progressively worse in the United States, we continued to send correspondents and crews and our White House team, you know, was on was on the clock every day. We started covering people losing their jobs, um, the economic fallout. So um, our, my, at least I, I can't speak, I think for Tom and I, we both got more busy with work because we had a duty to provide um, the information that was happening around the country. Was it hard to um, have to provide information that was happening all around the country? And when like, COVID first started, how did you guys, how, like, did it take long for you to transform into from going on set and producing to being at home and having to produce? Tom, do you want to, you want to take that one since you- um, Sure, sure, because I think our, our experiences were very similar and, and, you know, with little differences, whatever I went through, pretty much most people um, in our, in our production environment went through. Um, and uh, it was uh, very instantaneous. We, because the news has to happen every day, we didn't have uh, sort of time to adapt or figure out, you know, new ways to do things. We just had to, um, I think it was a week uh, where we had to transition and immediately be back up full speed again. Um, and, you know, miraculously, we, we actually made it work. Uh, I would say, you know, with little snacks here and there, of course, like everyone, but um, nothing, nothing major. Um, and the fact that our job is so computer-based already, even before the pandemic really helped because then all we had to do was instead of working with computers at work, we would work with computers at home. Um, I think maybe for Sharif, um, and, and you can definitely uh, elaborate on that, that probably changed more for you because I deal with the actual editing, which means I, I get pictures and I edit them, so that didn't change much. But for producers like Sharaf, who used to go out and interview people, that probably changed, right? Yeah, uh, we used to go out in the field, like jumping on an airplane and being in a different state in a different city every week, and that stopped. So we started doing everything like we're doing right now on the internet, whether it's Zoom or StreamYard or, um, or FaceTime, like everything shifted towards digital. So we weren't allowed to leave. And normally our job is to get out there and talk to people and go to a different state and figure out who's affected by what. And suddenly we couldn't do that. So we had to rely on technology. How long did it take for you, for your team to start to have a solid system for working together? I mean, that's a good question. Um, it, I think working together is part of making news, especially working in the TV business. The, it is always a team effort. It is always an editor, a producer, 
um, a correspondent, um, the anchor of the show, everybody plays a role in that. And once we started going working from home, um, it, there were some kinks, you know, trying to figure it out because it's something new. It's like a new muscle. You got to just figure out how it works. But we, it took us a couple, I think I'd say like a couple of days to really figure it out. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, you know, the, the nature of the business is that it's always changing and there's always new things popping up. Um, so even to this day, there's new unexpected little challenges that come up just because we're not, you know, physically in the office anymore. But I think at the same time, we, um, the fact that we really didn't have a choice and we just had to keep going and every day we had to make a show, I think that that helped because it, it didn't allow us to second guess ourselves and, and take too long to sort of find our footing. We just had to be ready no matter what. Um, and we kind of grew as we were going, um, you know, between the, the technical problems and the human problems and everything, we were just fixing them as we were going along. What was the most like difficult part? This is a question for Tom. What was the most difficult part of adjusting to editing at home instead of being like in a studio and on set editing? That's a good question. Um, definitely the human aspect of it, because again, the technical aspect, meaning, you know, me being in front of a computer and doing my work, the only difference is I'm not in my office anymore. I'm at home, but uh, as far as, you know, how the computer works and everything, it's pretty much the same. But obviously the big difference is that before I would meet with a lot of people during the day, if I was working, for example, with Sharaf, he would be either popping in my room or in my room and we would be interacting like that. And now we have to do Zoom sessions. We have to use email and Slack and all these other digital tools because it's a it's a job that requires a ton of communication between everyone um and so that's i think that's been a challenge just because you know when you're a room in a room with a lot of people you just ask questions people give you information um but when you're everybody's isolated and you still have to get all that information from everyone it's been a little trickier and now we are about to watch how you and tom work through it and edit on zoom All right, so let me, so this is, um, this system um, is called an Avid editing system. It's one of the more popular uh, video editing softwares out there. A lot of people use it in news, in the movies. Um, and basically what I have here on the screen um, is called a timeline. So um, this part here is basically where I use all the video that comes in and then I cut it together and I put the voice of our journalist, uh, I put the voice of the people we interview, uh, we work from a script, um, and then I put it together and when I'm completely done and everybody's happy, I send it um, to CBS, to the CBS people who put it on TV and, and everybody can watch it. Mm -hmm. um, so just to show you a little bit um, and then, you know, I'll let Sharif talk about the actual production part of it, how we are. Just to make it very simple, I would say the production part, Sharif's job is, is getting everything. And then my job, the editor's job, is putting it together. And I'm oversimplifying it, but I think in a nutshell, you could describe it like that. Um, but we have um, what we call uh, feeds, uh, which are basically satellite links um, that come from different places in the world. So, you know, right now, in this window, um, I have a satellite feed coming from the trial uh, of Derek Chauvin. Um, we have a satellite feed coming from a presser from Lindsey Graham. Um, another one coming uh, from the White House, um, talking about you know Afghanistan and so forth. And, and as you can see, we have a very large number of those. Um, and they're open 24-7 and they're, you know, either feeding things or just open in case we need them. Um, and then we can get more video if, if for any reason we don't have it um, from what we call our affiliates, which are people we work with in a local environment. Uh, we can get it from the web. We can get it from a number of sources. And then as an editor, I will 
follow the script that um, that the correspondent or the producer writes, and I will uh, put everything together um, using images, pictures, video, um, um, you know, the, the obviously the audio, um, graphics. Sometimes we have that are just animations that show some numbers. Um, and so, you know, for example, I, I loaded up from last week, we worked, we did an immigration series. So I was working uh, with, with a wonderful correspondent called Manny Bojorquez and, and his team. And, and they were, um, you know, in Guatemala and they were, they were sending us footage over those satellite feeds that I just showed you every day and making different stories. Um, and, you know, so it was about the, the, the kids going in the classrooms um, you see that that's that's a graphic, for example, what I was talking about <laughs> those numbers on screen, um, and and then we had a, a different piece another day um, about some people leaving for the U.S. and and the correspondent interviewing them and asking them, you know, why they want to come, um, and we had one more another day where um, it was about the floods and how that affected the local production. Um, so every story, you know, it's, is its own little entity um, that we work on as a team. Um, so, so again, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of steps, but in, in a nutshell, that's what my job entails. And as you can see right now, the screen that I'm showing you is actually my computer that's located physically at CBS, um, and I'm connected to it wirelessly. Uh, I mean, wire, wire, basically through the internet, um, and I can edit as if I was in front of my computer at work. Okay. Um, um, so that's pretty much it. I have a question. Is it ever hard, okay, since you are at home and you're using the satellite feed and the internet from your laptop and it's connecting all the way to the studio at CBS, is it ever difficult to see everything that happens? Like, does it ever lag or mess up? Um, that, that's a fair question. And you're right, actually. Um, it's It's... Generally okay. I was actually surprised how okay it was because I thought it would be a disaster. Uh, but uh, you know, we we have some pretty robust systems that make it fast enough to communicate with our computers. But of course, it's technology. So there's always that one time where um, you know I'm not able to connect uh, when I need to. There's these these other times where everything is really slow and I can't really edit because my mouse isn't moving fast enough. There's times where, um, you know, even though everything's supposed to be working, somebody cannot watch what I'm doing, all these little things. But I would say on average, you know, considering the fact that we're just, everybody's through the internet and we're doing everything, it's working decently. Cool. Uh, this is a follow-up question, like, can you tell me about the logistics of this process of getting the all of the um like the videos to come to your computer and like do you have to download it? Like what's the process of you being able to see it on your laptop? Sharif, you wanna take that one? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So basically, um, Tom, why don't you play a little bit of yeah. so we can I can kind of guide you through this a little. Sure. So I'm just gonna play this. I played like the first thirty seconds. Full of leaves. And this is the coffee bean. Yeah, yeah, okay. No good. Beef crop for Ruben Che and his family's livelihood. He's one of many farmers in the Guatemalan highlands devastated by back-to-back -back hurricanes last fall that barreled through the region with intensity and rainfall believed to be magnified by climate change. Sending us all up everything, houses and the crops. So something like that. Something like that. So basically what you just saw were a series of shots, right? You saw, you know, an interview with the gentleman there. You saw aerials, like a helicopter drone going over everything. And then you had close-ups with what's going on. So the team there, uh, the correspondent Manny, he has probably two to three people with him. Mm -hmm. Got a camera person and he has a producer at the base. And every morning before they start going out to like interview people where they're going, they will tell us kind of what they're hearing on the ground. They will tell us like, well, we're good. we heard 
that this village that was flooded out, you know, they're the reason why they're going up. So they will give us a detailed note as to what they're hearing, what they're understanding, and what they mean to what they mean to discover. I mean, that's part of the storytelling is a lot of times you go there and you interview people and you find rich sound or someone who lost his family members or a village that was wiped out. But at the same time, what they're telling me, I am going to tell Tom, my editor, this is kind of what's going on. This is where they're going. They're going to film this stuff. And then when they film it, right, they're going to feed all that stuff in the satellite that'll go directly to Tom's computer, right? And he's kind of showed us those feeds coming in. Now, the thing is that we are on a deadline. And that deadline is 6.30 every day. So that means we, he, we don't have the whole day to film and then send it. They have to be done at a certain time. And then when they feed their material, that also takes, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes, depending on how much they shot. So then what we'll do is when this feed is coming in, another team of people, will start logging every sentence, every word, every phrase, every um, ah, shot, they will write it out, right? And when they write it out, then we write, start writing the script. And the script is usually like a page, page and a half, where we detail every little thing about the story. And that also means sometimes, like for this story, this was about immigration, right? It was about why are people immigrating to America at a high rate? So we may also put in some, you know, a soundbite from President Biden that day. If President Biden said something about the border or immigration, that's part of the news, we put that in. So then we'd go back to that feed, find where President Biden said that and put that in. So then suddenly all those little squares and rectangles there, that's all different shots that we're putting in. And then when we write the script, we have a team of researchers fact check everything, right? On, par, on top of us fact checking, we wanna make sure every little detail is right. And, and we do that every day. So as soon as it airs, then we start over the next day. And it could be a Guatemala story, it could be George Floyd, it could be, you know, food story, it just varies on the news of the day. So the one thing that's different is that every day is a new day, right? So we don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes, you know, this has happened to me where I go into work and then they'll say at noon, can you go to Mississippi today, right? Today, don't go home, don't bring a bag, buy it all there. And then I'll be in Mississippi, not for a day, but for like a week, just wearing this, right? And then you're there, you know, filming and whatever story we have to do. So it varies, but that's kind of logistically how it goes from idea to air, in a nutshell. What are the biggest pain points in production when you are in the same place as your team? Can you say that one more time? What is the biggest what? Pain points in production when you are in the same place as your team? Oh man, if we're in the same place, the communication is easy. I can just turn to Tom and just ask him a certain question. If I'm in the field um, and, and the field team is there, I don't have to rely on a telephone or a text. I can actually see what's happening, right? A lot of times you have to like wait and see because you know we are, we are looking at the first draft of what's happening. You know, we are looking at the first drafts of what happened in Minnesota, right? And, and all these things are happening around the world and the country. So it's easy just to turn and to see, oh, there are people that are raiding the Capitol building. Oh, there, there's a flood right over here. That's where it's happening. When you have that eyewitness, it is just much easier versus waiting for all this footage to come in through the satellite, then from the satellite down, and then it gets to Tom's computer, then we can see it. Would you consider like when you were in this, um, like there with your team, that was more convenient like, by what you said, but would you consider 
having to wait for the videos and all of the things that you have to put on the news to like waiting for a satellite feed, would you consider that less convenient? It, it depends, right? It depends on what it is. If every, everybody, everybody wants everything fast, right? Everybody wants every information, like a text, you know, TikTok video, you want it quick, right? So um, yeah, it is a little, it, it does take a while for some of this stuff to come. So it is a little inconvenient, but sometimes um, you want to look at every single shot that comes in because sometimes every single shot is that important. Sometimes when you're looking at footage and you're seeing what's happening, you need to be extra sure. Or Tom can talk about this. We'll get a phone call from someone, you know, at a wildfire or somebody who's covering an earthquake or someone who's covering, you know, the president arrives at a town and they will tell us, you know what, there's a great section that we got that we were able to film. We got President Biden giving a hug. We got LeBron James giving a high five to somebody, right? We got we got the Lakers winning a big championship, you know, because you know nobody likes the Nets. Just kidding, just kidding, right? <laughs> but <laughs> um, and then we'll look for that in the feed because sometimes they won't know what's what's coming. They'll say it's somewhere in that where you know this guy does something great. Right. And um, so we'll have to watch the feed and we'll go frame by frame and then we'll say, aha, there it is. We found it. Right. And then Tom will grab it and then we'll put it in. And then sometimes we'll put that on social media. Sometimes we'll put all, you know, it'll be on TikTok or wherever, wherever you want to tease it. We'll put it out there. You know. And to add to that also, I think, um, which ties to the whole idea of this being really teamwork, um, the people that are shooting something have certain ideas and and that's why usually they're the ones writing the script right and a lot of times you know it makes total sense they they see the best stuff they they ask us for the best stuff we put the best stuff and it all works fine right and sometimes what they think will work just doesn't work right just because they witnessed it or they were there and it happened either just because they didn't shoot it right or because it just doesn't look the way they thought um um Sharaf and I, the producer and the editor, will also have their own input and will be like, you know, we know you really wanted to start with this moment, which you probably thought was great. It's just not that strong. We found this other amazing moment, which we think you really should start with. And then we're going to have a back and forth and sometimes they'll agree with us. Um, so that's why it's also important to us having the time to watch that stuff and have our own sort of personal opinion form on that. Um, because it's you know realistically and you know obviously every story is different sometimes we have multiple days to work on a story like those immigration stories sometimes i just had one day sometimes i had a couple of days and in those cases i have the time to go through everything think about it sleep it over sometimes we just don't have the time it's just you know dumped on our lap and we just have to make something really really quickly and in that case we rely on whatever they tell us um but there's definitely a lot of 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 flexibility and liberty to um, give our own input um, and then say, hey, you know what? And, and you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know what? That's actually a great point. Let's let's try that. Um, so that's something that's really cool about our, our job. What are some technical tools, tools, apps, and programs like youth, can, youth filmmakers can use right now to collaborate with each other from afar? Um, I'll start and then Sharaf, you yeah, can, go ahead, yeah, can go probably ahead. know stuff that I, I don't know, but, um, so, so what I, I showed you before is a little more advanced, Avid is, is definitely a professional program. Uh, not that it's, you know, it's, they do have a, a student version and it's not impossible to learn. It's, it just takes a little time. Um, but there are, um, because I think of the pandemic too, they've developed a lot of uh, software that is much easier and more geared toward um, a digital environment and, and, a, and a remote environment. Um, so there's, there's, for example, for editing, there's editing software made uh, by this company, Adobe, and they have their own professional software, which is called Premiere, but then they also have a version called Premiere Rush, which you can even use on your phone. Um, so you would be shooting on your phone and then you would be starting an edit 
but then it links up and if you go home and you open it on your computer you can actually continue so that's really cool um there's there's a lot of other basic software to allow uh, you know editing remote collaboration all those things um, but even zoom itself as silly as it sounds um, you know, a lot of people were just using it to communicate and it, it was kind of dismissed, but because people have had to use it for so long, they've developed workflows. Um, you know, last year I, I teach a class for journalism uh, for graduate students and the pandemic hit right when they were about to start doing their own shows. Um, and so everybody had to go home and evacuate the campus and all our studios and everything was off limits. Um, and so we, we didn't know how to make it work. And we actually tried just with Zoom. And, the, you know, each student would have a camera, would dress up, would, you know, take out the picture of their kids, like me behind them and make it a little more professional. Um, and, and do, you know, professional journalistic work on Zoom. And then somebody would just record it and put it together. And it looked very, very good for, you know, the fact that it was shot through Zoom and done at home. I was actually extremely surprised. Yeah, those are all really good. I would also recommend, um, I'm, I'm the first thing I would do is, if you have a phone, don't shoot like this, shoot <laughs> like this, right? That's rule rule number one, right? Everybody should be shooting like this. No, I know everyone goes like this and they go like that, but shoot like that. And then iMovie is great. Like just start putting stuff on a timeline. I mean, you saw Tom's timeline. The timeline is the best way to, to learn and to learn how to add dissolves and learn how to add cuts and to experiment. And so it's an easy way to just kind of make the cuts and edits kind of easier to, um, yeah, just like that, like that, that timeline right there. You can create your own timeline on iMovie, right? Yeah. And if you're on Instagram and you want to put things together, it's also a timeline, right? It's just how you tell the story. TikTok, same thing. Right, so start practicing that way, you know, and then once you master that, then your TikToks are gonna be dope, your Instagrams are gonna be awesome, and then you can add like, add all these cool effects and everything like that, and that's cool, right? And then you can add graphics and it's, it's fun and it pops, right? But just start putting things on that timeline, and iMovie is, I use iMovie when I need something in a quick fix, I will put that down, quick timeline, quick couple edits, three shots, Right. So I think those those are just basic ways just to learn. And it's and it's a lot of fun. Going back in time a little bit, um, can you each tell me a little bit about your career trajectories and how you got to where you are now? Hmm. OK, I'll I'll start. I'll keep it short because I can talk about this for a <laughs> long time. Um, I am originally from Los Angeles, California, hence my love and appreciation for the greatest sports team of all time, the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, think I, just, I think I just saw a lot of people drop off. <laughs> um, I went to um, a school called Chapman University. I went to film school uh, where I studied filmmaking and screenwriting. I was a film major and peace studies major. And then after that, I worked in Hollywood for about a year. I worked for this guy named Robert Greenwald and we made documentary films. Um, and then after that, I worked at a nonprofit for civil rights. And I bounced between LA and DC for a number of years. Then I moved over to grad school at Columbia and I went to journalism school and I did some writing for the New York Times, did some work for ABC News, worked at NBC News for about M NBC, MSNBC and the Today Show for about five years and did presidential campaigns, did all the breaking news around the world, traveled everywhere, and um, did some work at the Huffington Post, and then um, ended up at CBS, where I've been here for about four, five years now. Okay. Tom? Um, so um, it's funny, there's actually a, a funny coincidence because um, I've also started in film school. I think we're probably the only two uh, journalists at CBS who went to film school, which is probably why we get along so well. Um, and I actually studied uh, film when I was in Europe, when I was in France. Um, and then I did an exchange program with the US um, that allowed me to come here one year in New York for free, which obviously, you know, jumped on and, and immediately came here. 
Um, and then when I finished my studies, I worked like Sharaf, I worked a little bit in everything. I did uh, commercials, I did um, music videos, uh, movies, uh, corporate films. Um, and I started slowly specializing uh, into editing. And um, from that, I also started going into more news and um, documentary and things like that. Um, I worked with a, with a number of, um, at the beginning, I was working mainly with uh, news organizations that come from abroad, um, from the Middle East, from Europe. And then when they come to the US and especially New York, they needed a team here. So I was part of that team. Um, from there, I worked uh, with ABC News for about three years um, and then switched over to CBS News, which I've been for um, nine years now. Um, and um, parallel to my work at CBS uh, as an editor, I also, as I said, teach uh, at Columbia uh, grad school uh, editing class uh, for journalism. You said you started um, to do like, you started school, um, Tom, in Europe for like producing and what you do now for CBS, was it different from, was the school in Europe different from in New, when you came to New York or, what, or was it the same? It's a very interesting question. Um, no, it was very different. And that was, that was the reason that I not only wanted to come here, but that I actually ended up staying here. Uh, because I think in Europe, we have more of a tradition of um, schools being uh, all about theory. And they're great. So, you know, we had every teacher I had had written 10 of the best books about film and, you know, but none of them had actually made a movie, uh, which was something that I actually wanted to do. I didn't want to write books. I wanted to make films. Um, and so when I came here, um, I was in, in this um, um, college called Brooklyn College, which actually has a really, really nice uh, film program. And the big difference was here, everybody was about making films and making and producing, you know, and all the teachers were people who probably none of them had ever written a book, but they had done, you know, dozens of movies between them. Um, and so they were much more hands-on. They were much more about the professional aspect of it, uh, about how do you, you know, succeed in the industry, how do you even start in the industry. Um, and so that's exactly what I was looking for. Okay. Now I think we're going to take questions from anyone that in the chat that has questions for Sharaf and Tom. So if anyone has questions, just put it in the chat. We have some questions here already. Um, says Carolyn Johnson says been says from the Paul after school. Someone asked, how did the COVID-19 transition affect your, the guest speaker's family? Well, what usually what after, during COVID-19, and we had guest speakers on, um, we just used Zoom. You know, we just used Zoom, and it, it was a little weird at first, but now everyone's kind of used to it. So... It was just much easier for families and everybody to just do interviews with us in their living room or in their office, in their house, in their home, rather than driving and going to a station. And, you know, it's just a huge headache. Now it's just, you know, when, when, in a matter of seconds, we can have an interview and get what we want. So it's really made that part of the part of the business easier. Oh, we have another question. It says, what do you hope will happen as you are telling these stories around the world on the news? I think the, we just want people to listen and learn something, right? I think that's just to understand kind of what's going on. If we can be, give them, give them as much information that we know is factually correct and to tell them kind of what's happening around, not just their neighborhood, but the world, um, that's kind of our goal, you know? And um, if we can continue to do that on a consistent basis where 
you can come to our show 6.30 every, every, every evening and get a good idea as to what happened throughout the world and how it in, impacts your life. And um, you get exactly, you know, fair, unbiased, no, no opinions, but just what happened. That's kind of the goal. Uh, another question says, with technology at home and working in 24 hour news cycles, how do you make sure you don't get involved and lose track of your own life and those who care about you and love you? And then those you care about and love. I think uh, this one I can take since I actually have a family. Sharif is on the way, but uh, I'm already there. So um, I can probably speak about it a little more. And um, it's not easy. It's, it's definitely, um, I think all, it's it's kind of ironic because our job is so um, consuming that um, we were already having to deal with that issue even before the pandemic. Um, just because you know, when for example, when a major event happens, um, unfortunately, a lot of those times it's when it's shootings or things like that. Suddenly, everybody has to stay. Right? There is no. Oh, I need to go home. I, our our needs are secondary to the needs of the story. And so that's always been an issue, but obviously um, with us being home, we have to be extra careful because I think like everyone working from home right now, it's so easy to lose track of time, to just assume, well, people are just, they just have to turn on the computer and they can do something more, you know, so let's ask them more and more. So you kind of have to separate these things and, and put some boundaries. And also, um, you know, I think the other aspect of it is just because now that's changing, but until recently, we just couldn't go out a lot. We were just, even when we weren't working, we we're stuck home. Um, so I think it, it, I made an effort to really take time off, use my vacation, even if I was home without actually just working, just to clear my mind, spend time with my family um, and, and just have that aspect of my life not be overwhelmed by the professional aspect. Uh Question from Carolyn Johnson. She said, I asked the students if they remember a time when the weather affected the weather broadcast. A student stated that he remembers the sound going in and out during the broadcast of the weather. Like, so while now that you guys are home and you guys have to, like when you guys are going live on the news, you guys have to talk through home, like, has there ever been a time where it was like a bad storm or just bad weather in general and the sound wasn't really good? Uh, bad weather, yeah. Um, that happens a lot. <laughs> um, and not just us, like we'll be with our team. I think our team in Houston, right? Um, there, That's when the bad storm hit and the, their pipes were freezing and they had, they were living the bad weather and reporting the news and we had to work around that. Um, when there's a snowstorm here, we have to work through that. There's bad weather, there's bad sound, there's, we can't hear anything. That happens, that I'm flooding. I've been in situations and flooding where we're in flooded water and water's up to like your chest here or something and you gotta make calls like that. That kind of stuff happens, especially when you're at home now. Um, you hear more of those sounds and when there is bad weather, um, it can definitely impact it. Mm. Someone says, how should students go about finding a mentor in filmmaking? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I'm gonna tell you two different things. Tom, you can, you can chime in as well. I think the first thing is, is very indirect, but if you find a good filmmaker and you see them on Instagram, DM them, tell them your story, tell them how old you are, tell them I like the work you're doing, would love any points and tips. That would be um, the first point of contact. Um, and the other thing is go to where these filmmakers are, like go to film festivals and talk to them and, 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 and see what they're about, see who, who will listen to you you'll definitely pick up a mentor there. Um, and then the most important thing to find a mentor is to be a filmmaker, you have to make films. So yeah. make films, submit them to festivals and the mentor will find you. 
really. You know, once you start think, putting things out there, things start coming your way. Go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I think also one thing that I learned uh, when I was younger, up to these extremely unattainable and, and very, very amazing filmmakers, which, you know, um, there was no way that I could connect with, especially back then, you know, social media wasn't as prevalent. Um, and I slowly realized that you can have mentors that are not necessarily much older and much more accomplished than you. Um, uh, they can be on the same level or trajectory as you are. Um, and as Sharif said, you know, when you start making films and you start being in the media field, uh, you, you sort of meet a lot of people who are have the same aspirations and dreams as you. And I actually found a lot of mentors like that. I, I still have very, very good friends and people that, um, you know, I talk to regularly, even though now I'm more in news and not in film anymore. Um, they're still in film. And they were those people who are starting out like me. And we, we almost mentor each other in a way. Yeah. Uh, another question. Do you feel like this is the new normal, like, from shifting to for shifting to virtual production instead of being in video? Yes, this is the new normal. Um, it's definitely gone um, from a newsroom to people's homes. And a lot, a lot of places are now trying to um, make this more permanent. Um, and for us, like, I don't know when we're going back. Um, it is easier when you are next to each other, but for Tom and such, it's the product is just as good, in fact, a little bit stronger sometimes when you're working from home. So this is, I think, isn't just for news media. I think across the board now, you're gonna see a lot more people being able to work from home. The culture around the country has changed, um, that it's more acceptable to work, or actually have a few days at home. Well, that was the last question from the viewers. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, I think you can put more in the chat. But I have some other questions of my own that I would like to read. Um, this one is for Sharaf. Mm -hmm. What made you want to be a producer for the, for the news? Like, was it something that interested you about it? that like you're like hey i want to be a producer for the news or did it were you just like i want to try something new i've seen like or i've seen and did producing for a music video or something and you're like i want to try the news yeah it was i've always had i've always wanted to work in news um to be honest i just thought i could do it better than the people that were doing it because I just didn't like the way they were doing it. So I thought, hey, I can do that. If they're if they're not doing that, this is me in college. Um, so I thought that's kind of how I kind of got the bug. But I just always wanted to tell stories. I just always, that's why I went to film school. I just wanted to tell stories that, that were important, that had value, that impacted me, and could show people that looked like me and put them on TV um, and just tell interesting things. And I thought this was one of the best ways to do it. And um, it's been great. If you were not producing for the news, would do you think you would be producing for movies or music videos? Yeah, I mean, I think if I wasn't doing news, I would definitely be, you know, hopefully somewhere in LA, you know, working on scripted TV or reality TV or writing stories and stuff like that definitely would be some something in the media landscape I would be participating in. Um, yeah, definitely. Besides producing, what is something that you are really good at and love to do? Um, I love to play music. I'm in, I'm, I'm in a band. Uh, the CBS News has a band and we're, we, so we jam, we jam out. I love to play basketball. Um, I love to watch basketball. Um, I love to, love to watch LeBron James dominate on the court all the time, <laughs> if I can. Um, and um, yeah, and enjoy the city. I love I just, there's a lot of things I love to do that are away from the news. And as Tom said earlier, it's good to um, keep us, 
to take time away from looking at the screen and looking at my phone and just always being on and finding stories and calling sources and contacts and you know getting information it's good to step away and music and um basketball um and, and are two good ways to do that music definitely for like for the times now music definitely will help you with things like you need to get away from yeah like the internet and all just music or going outside to get some fresh air exercising yeah we have some some questions in the chat it said when you are communicating and the earpiece breaks, is there a backup system to communicate? Um, when the IFB, uh, you usually have a producer um, nearby, and that producer, which is usually me, I usually have two phones on talking, and then I will communicate with the correspondent. If it's the anchor, there's multiple people around, and they will they will find ways to communicate with her uh, or him when their earpiece does go off, and it does happen. Sometimes it goes off, but that's when a good a good talented anchor can really just talk, right? That's when talent comes in, and then a lot of times it's happened. You just haven't even noticed. <laughs> so yeah, it does happen. But there's multiple ways we will get in touch, and yeah. How do you all, um, another question in the chat is, how do you all foresee the news evolving in the next 20 to 25 years? Oh, man. Um. <laughs> I, I can take that one if you want. Although yeah. I'll probably be completely wrong because whoever tries to forecast the future, that's a false errand. But um, I do think um, that Sharif is completely right, that things just won't go back to normal. I think we all, we all feel that and know that. Obviously, the question is, what will the new normal be? Um, I think that your generation um, uh, will have to learn things in a different way than we did, and maybe even work in a different way than we did, um, because um, you will be asked to know more, do more, faster, and more efficiently than we did. Um, and that might sound a little overwhelming, um, but again, because I, I teach students and I see that happening in front of my eyes and I see how they deal with it, it's, it's not a bad thing and it just makes you more flexible. It makes you more dynamic. It makes you more well-rounded because you know just so many more things you need to know in order to do your job. Um, so I think once you accept that, um, I think, you know, the news is kind of its own thing, but the media in general um, will reward the people who are the most forward-thinking, the, the ones who... It, it's both a, a very scary time and an, and an amazing time, I think, just because a lot of things that used to be, you know, here for, for decades and just worked one way are suddenly gone or are in the process of going. Um, and so that's can be kind of, you know, scary but at the same time i think the the cool part to it is that there's all these new opportunities these new jobs these new apps these new forms of communication that are popping up every day and if you're the kind of person who is willing to go with the flow and and not get stuck in just one thing and kind of like try new things um i i really think that then you can succeed yeah I I get what you're saying because a lot of things with COVID, like people, I bet like most people that produce the news or movies in, or whatever in general it has to do with videos, they're probably not used to doing everything at home. But now that you have like we have to get used to it, there's so many apps that we can use. If we don't have like professional cameras that can make it look like you're using a professional camera, but you're really not. Yeah. Totally. Another question in the chat is, do you have any words of advice for aspiring producer, for aspiring producer editors and directors? Um, 
Yeah. Um, keep telling stories. Don't stop. You know, don't. If you have an idea, write it down. If you have a good story idea, keep jotting it down. Um, the best the best way to tell a story is to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Um, you know, I had just two quick things. Um, when I was in film school, there were these two guys in my screenwriting class that loved 1980s nostalgia. Like they loved it, they loved it. And they kept writing and telling stories about it and doing cool things with it. And everybody thought they were dumb because like, why you care about 1980s? But they just loved it. And then these guys go on to make Stranger Things on Netflix, right? And they're one of the top directors in Hollywood. So whatever you are interested in, just focus on that and just keep writing and keep trying and keep you know, filming this way. And then, um, you know, and just putting things out there and trying things. Because the only way you'll get better at it and the only way people will see your work is if you put something out there. So um, just keep doing that. Even if you think it sucks, put it out there. Uh, another question, uh, well, actually the last question that's in the chat is, do you have a passion, a passion project that you would like to bring to the screen anytime soon? Tom, I'll let you... Uh, um, oh wow, that's that's a tough one. Um, I think uh, there's definitely a lot of um, stories that I love to tell in a documentary form because it's kind of a, a perfect marriage between the news world and the film world. Um, and and especially there's stories that I discover by working on them in the news world. And just because we have a minute thirty on a Thursday afternoon to tell that story, I know that I would love to tell more about X or Y story. Um, I, I don't have a, a specific you know, idea right now that comes to my mind, but um, I definitely know that, uh, you know, especially with everything that's going on in the world, um, I would love to work on documentaries that talk about the challenges of modern life, about, about all the, um, the, the changes that are happening in society. Um, I think a lot of that stuff deserves a, a longer discussion a longer form um, and and just being able to dig in to those stories and, and get to uh, um, a, a deeper level of, of understanding them. Well, this was the DYCD at home filmmaking series with Sharaf Maujud and Thomas Zanakis. Thanks everyone for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you, Trishan, for hosting it. Yeah, Trishan, excellent job. Excellent job. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Great job, Trishan. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye.